Hey there, and welcome. So good to have you with me today. Today we are talking about iridology, fact and fiction, myths and fables. Now, if you haven't uh, already done so, if you're not on my mailing list, but you'd like to know when things are happening, when we've got courses and trainings happening, hop on over to iridology.education. And when that little pop-up box comes up that says, would you like to opt in for the downloadable iridology map, go ahead and put your information in there. That will put you on my mailing list and you will be notified of when we have free trainings like this, as well as courses and everything is always online. My name is Judith Cobb. I am a master herbalist, a natural nutrition clinical practitioner, and a certified comprehensive iridology instructor. I've been at this holistic wellness business for 40 years. So while we are waiting for Instagram and Facebook to stream, again, I'm going to ask you to hop on over to iridology.education and get opted in. It's so good to see so many people joining us today. We've got Heather with us and Theodora and lots of people joining us on the webinar, as well as people joining us on Instagram. Fun, fun. Let's dive in by talking about one of the most famous myths that is perpetrated about iridology. How many of you have heard the owl story? If you've heard the owl story, let's have you raise your hand or make a comment in the chat box. Let me know that you have heard the owl story. Yeah, right? It's, it's really out there, isn't it? I heard this story when I first started doing iridology 40 years ago. And so, you know, it's been around for longer than that, but here's how it goes. The story goes that a little boy named Ignaz von Petschle was about 11 years old. That's the only consistent fact we've got in this story. He caught an owl or an owl landed on his arm or he found an owl that had a broken leg. There's all three versions of the story that are out there. Then it says that he noticed that there was a dark line in the owl's eye and that he saw it form after the owl's leg got broken. Interesting. Again, I'm not sure. Some people say that it was that he, um, he found the owl with the broken leg and the line was there. Some say that the leg got broken as he tried to catch the owl and then the line showed up in the owl's eye. So we're just not sure which version is right, but the story also goes that as the owl's leg healed, the line disappeared. Bill Cardona says this about that story. Modern iridology can't explain the, the owl's story. Von Petschley's story from a very long time ago has not been reproduced. So it's just a waste of time to repeat it. It just creates confusion. Critical thinking is required when, uh, when applied to any topic. Doesn't it make sense that a veterinarian would have noticed a similar thing? I mean, how many veterinarians work with birds, right? How many birds have a broken leg or a broken wing? Wouldn't veterinarians have noticed the same thing? There's a lot of bird rescue facilities out there as well. Wouldn't they notice similar things? But they haven't. There's been no one who's replicated or noticed this very same thing, and that's over the last 150 plus years. Bill Cardona goes on to say, if you look at the picture of any owl's, or if you look at a picture of an owl's eyes, or most any animal, the structure of the iris is different from humans. There is no anterior stroma, just a smooth posterior leaf without individual strands. So it's structurally impossible to have such an event. So what does this all mean? Let's look at another myth that's out there. I see this a lot on social media, people posting before and after pictures, the before picture, and then they say, I did this incredible cleanse for six weeks and now look at my eyes. And so what we know, however, is that that doesn't happen. The eye rides don't change fast enough to monitor any changes in a matter of a few weeks or months. The eye rides also don't give up pigment that has been deposited in them. What we do know changes is the sclera. The sclera can change. That's the white of the eye can change. We can see blood vessels become more prominent or that we can see them recede depending on how acute or chronic the problem was and what was done about it. The second thing we need to know is that the eye rides actually accumulate pigment. They don't disperse it. These are my husband's eyes taken at the age of 42. 
and at the age of 65. So there's a whole bunch of differences we want to contrast here. And we want to explain why the differences are there. The first stop is look at the color of the iris itself. A lot of people on social media would say, oh, this one at age 65, man, he's done a lot of work on his health. He's really cleansed. Look how bright and vibrant those eyes are. Nope, not the case. Tell you why in a few minutes. Look at the color of the white of the eye. Very different from one to the other. Look at the skin tones from one to the other. Now look at the iris, uh, at the flash uh, remnant that's here, the artifact of the light. This was an incandescent flash. This was taken with a print film camera. This is a 24 megapixel camera with an LED flash. Each of these cameras have a white balance and the, the digital camera also has settings. You can set it to look like it's fluorescent lighting or tungsten lighting or daylight or, you know, you've got all these different options and each of them has a different temperature or different warmth of light. That will also affect the color change. So while my husband has done a lot of work on his health over the last 40 years, the fact of the matter is he hasn't, his eyes haven't changed except that we know that pigment accumulates. Pigment accumulates because of genetic influence. And so this pigment, as it has surfaced, as it has accumulated, is telling us about inherently uh, predisposed conditions and situations and imbalances that are being activated now, that are active. And so knowing that, we actually use this to guide our program development for him. My husband has a very clean diet. He doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. We don't drink pop. We don't have white sugar. We don't have white flour. We eat a lot of vegetables and produce. So, you know, his, his eyes, though, have not changed in response to that. And we can see that now as we continue to do photos of his eyes. But do notice that the capillaries in the sclera have changed. So we see here, we've got this lightning bolt one here. Notice that it is thicker now. But notice how this vessel was thick so many years ago, but now look at how much thinner it is. So this is very dynamic. This is all about what is going on in his body right now. The iris is inherent. It's what we've inherited over the past three to four generations. Shows us where our inherent strengths and weaknesses are. This is dynamic. And so this is showing us that whatever this is pointing to is not getting better. It might actually be collapsing on us a little bit. But whatever this is all about is significantly better. All right. Let's do another example of befores and afters. Now, this is sort of going back to that owl story about a broken bone showing up in the iris and blah, blah, blah. So this is my eye in 2017, and this is the arm reaction field right here. Um, early on in March, about March 12th, I slipped on some ice and I fell and I broke both of my forearm bones near the wrist ended up in surgery that day, had two incisions to insert two plates and 12 screws to hold my bone together. So this is five days after the surgery. This is exactly the same as this. Then I'd been out of the cast for about a week. I was at my son's house. I slipped on the stairs, fell down the stairs, landed on my elbow and broke my elbow on the same side. So my left arm, then had another break that was serious. And again, I was in surgery and had hardware inserted. But again, there's no difference in the arm zone. So this is about eight days after that accident and injury. Then a few months later, it's still the same. You'll notice color differences. That's because I like to play with my camera settings. I'm trying to find the exact right setting to get the most accurate color reproduction but we're not concerned about color in this, this case. We're concerned about the fiber structure and how things are sitting in the eyes and nothing changed. You would think that with three breaks, with three surgeries, with three sets of hardware, something would be different if it was gonna change. 
something in my eyes would show, but no, it doesn't. It doesn't. Although the arm is healed up beautifully and is fully functional, and I'm grateful for modern medicine for that. We've also been taught, oh, I want to touch on one more thing with these. I've had people say, yes, but in those years, look at the fiber structure has improved. The fibers are straighter. The fiber structure is a result of the size of the, the pupil. The larger the pupil, the more, con, the more cramped the fibers are going to be. They get squished into a shorter distance. And that means they're going to be wrinklier. When we have a brighter light and the pupil is smaller, it stretches those fibers out. That makes them look straighter and neater and stronger. So we always need to consider pupil size when we are doing these assessments as well. You'll see on Facebook and places like that, people saying that you pigments mean you have toxins and that you can cleanse those out. Harry Wolf, who is the father of constitutional iridology in North America, he is an American-born German. He speaks German and he reads German. He got interested in iridology and started reading the original books that were written in German. And this is what he says. In fact, it's bogus and a dogma only found among some holdouts from the Lindlar, Kreitzer, Jensen schools of thought. The notion that certain metals, minerals, toxins routinely show up as diagnostic indicators in the iris has long been refuted and proven unreliable. There is no evidence to support the notion that heavy metal toxicity is measurable in the iris. Likewise, drugs, candida, etc. The dark spots or the pigments are genetically predetermined as is the overall color scheme. But remember, Everything in our body that's genetically predetermined doesn't happen, doesn't show up at birth. I mean, I've got crow's feet now that I didn't have when I was 20, right? And sure, that's from smiling a lot and from laughing a lot and stuff like that. But it's also that the collagen is programmed to break down at a certain point in time, and that will lead to more wrinkles. So we can't cleanse toxins out. Or, uh, sorry, let me say this different. You can cleanse toxins out, but toxins don't equal pigments. And doing a cleanse to get rid of toxins is not going to get rid of pigments. There's another myth out there that is we can see indications of parasites in the body by looking at the eyes. And they are going with this and calling these parasite lines. That again is a throwback and it's inaccurate. Harry Wolf says American sources from the turn of the 20th century are very unreliable repetitive and very misleading with silly and debunked notions like drug spots, sorg itch spots, healing lines and parasite lines, and brown eyes turn blue with detox. So here's the deal. You know, we talk about diagnosing and, and people are often doing a diagnosis from the eyes, but only licensed medical practitioners are legally allowed to diagnose. Iridologists, even if we are naturopaths and medical doctors, do not diagnose from the irides. Now, it doesn't matter what we think about the idea that only licensed medical doctors can diagnose. That's not a relevant point here. The point is that as iridologists, we are not to be diagnosing because when we look at an eye, we see genetic predispositions, inherent predispositions towards general weaknesses. We don't see disease names. Now, I studied Jensenian iridology way back in the early 80s. I did a lot of diagnosing from the eyes back then. I told a lot of people what was wrong with them, and the funny thing was that I was usually the one that was wrong. Now, I'm not dissing Jensen here. I so honor and respect him for the fact that he kept iridology alive when there was no communication between Europe, where all the research was going on, and North America. He faced so much persecution for what he did, and I'm ever so grateful that he did because it laid the foundation for us to be able to build on it and move forward. So fast forward after learning constitutional in the early 1990s, I found that I was right more often than I was wrong. I found that's because I wasn't doing a diagnosis. I was asking more general questions as directed by the eyes and as directed by combining what I saw in the eyes with what the client was complaining about, what their symptoms were. I found that I was right a lot more often and that I could do an iris analysis more quickly while creating deeper rapport with my clients. It was really magical. 
Bill Cardona goes on to say, iridology cannot be used to diagnose. It is a unique assessment tool to gain understanding of the blueprint of the body, including tendencies towards illness patterns or assessment of resiliency and resistance against negative influences. But diagnosing the presence or status of disease or illness is never appropriate. So based on my last 30 years of being a constitutional iridologist, a master herbalist, and a natural nutrition clinical practitioner, I have been teaching wellness practitioners like you the art and science of constitutional iridology. Registration is now open for the April start dates of my course, Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology, and I'd love to share the details of the course with you, but that's not what you came here for today. So instead, if you will indulge me with just a few minutes, I would like to just introduce the program. Introducing Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology for nutritionists, herbalists, and naturopaths. This is the only live, online, fully mentored course for holistic practitioners who want to streamline their clinical work without sacrificing client care, so they can stop working unpaid overtime to develop client programs, stop overwhelming their clients with undoable programs, and create programs that will increase client compliance, success, and long-term retention. Does any of that sound like something you want in your wellness practice? If it does, then I'm inviting you to join me Thursday, April 2nd at 5 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time for an informational webinar that will give you everything you need to know to decide whether this course is for you at this point in time. We'll talk about who this course is designed for, how it will benefit you in your wellness practice. We'll talk about what's included, what are all of the learning materials, what is all of the support and mentoring you get in the scope of this practice. And we'll also, of course, talk about the tuition. So I invite you to join me at iridology, or rather go to iridology.education slash webinar to register for this webinar. And join me for this webinar Thursday, April 2nd, 5 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time, so that we can go over what the course is all about. Again, thank you so much for being with me today. I truly appreciate it. I hope you've learned some good things about iridology, what some of the myths are and what the truths are on the other side of those myths. And I look forward to seeing you Thursday on the, the info webinar. Take care and have a great day. Bye for now.